Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Godfrey, and I'm the director of Bonington Gallery at Nottingham Trent University. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's rescheduled event entitled Art School and the Look, Fashion, Music and Lifestyle in Nottingham and Beyond with Paul Gorman. This is happening on the occasion of John Beck and Matthew Cornford's exhibition, The Art Schools of the East Midlands, happening right now in Bonington Gallery. Tonight is part of a programme of events that take as their starting point the multifaceted subject of art schools and wider themes related to creative education as a whole and how it has changed and been related to over a period of many years. As a slight change to the premise of tonight's event and to continue a slight run of bad luck we've had lately, we won't be joined by representatives from Nottingham's fashion history so tonight's event will focus on Paul's research, practice and recent projects in more depth. Just to reassure you that a longer term project about Nottingham and the region's fashion past is in the pipeline. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Before I hand over, I just want to give a warm thanks to Paul for being happy to move the event online after he was unable to make the original date due to illness. And a big thanks to Matthew and John for making such a fantastic exhibition with us and presenting such a rich platform in which to host events like the one tonight. Many thanks. Good evening. Um, welcome to uh, the Art School and the Look. My name is John Beck and I'm here with my colleague Matthew Cornford and we are responsible for the show that is currently on at the Bonington Gallery called The Art Schools of the East Midlands and this is the latest um, iteration of the project that Matthew and I have been working on for a few years where we are um, in the process of doing a survey of the art schools of Great Britain um, we're looking at the, the various art schools throughout the country, region by region. Um, the spine of the project is a, a photographic survey. And so in the show at the Bonington, for example, we have um, new original photographs of the 11 art schools from the East Midlands, um, as well as some photographic details of the art school on Waverley Street in Nottingham, which features um, the heads of celebrated artists from the past. So part of our project is gathering the uh, photographic uh, documentation of all the art schools in, in, the, in the country, region by region. But we're also exploring the history of those art schools and the, the place of the arts in the towns and cities across the country as they are now. So this is partly a kind of a historical uh, investigation and it's partly an exploration of the place of the arts in the UK now in the 21st century. Um, as part of our exhibition, one of the things we wanted to do was invite um, people to talk about the idea of art school and the place of the arts, um, particularly in relation to Nottingham's well-known um, uh, reputation as a centre for fashion and textiles. Um, Nottingham, of course, going back to the 19th century, uh, was known for its lace manufacture and fashion and knitwear in particular and textiles have been a part of Nottingham Art School and the, the kind of culture of the, of the city and the region for a long time. Um, we couldn't think of anyone better to talk about the relationship between art, music, style and fashion than Paul Gorman, um, a, the journalist, writer and curator who has over the last at least 20 years produced a, 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 an impressive body of books, exhibitions, maps um, and other um, media that look at Look! Look at the T-shirts. Yeah, but look! But look at the look at the sort of the history of British street style, um, boutiques, fashion in relation to music, music um, journalism, um, and it feels it it felt felt to us 
that when we thought about art school, we didn't, we weren't just thinking about study, but we were thinking about art school as an idea, as a kind of cluster of interests, as a, as a set of communities that come together. And Paul's work, uh, it felt felt to us, really kind of captured something of the spirit of the art school, as both as we remembered it and also as we think it probably still is in lots of ways. So we're really pleased to welcome Paul this evening to have a talk about his work um, ideas about art school, uh, street style, fashion, um, the fashion industry, um, music, the, the collision of these various kind of um, art forms. Um, Paul's work, Paul's books, I just want to give, remind you of um, some of Paul's books. On the screen there you have uh, the image of Paul's book from 2001, first edition, called The Look, which is where we got our title for this evening, uh, The Look, Adventures in Pop and Rock Fashion for 2001. First, second edition came out, I think, in 2006. Um, uh, Paul has also uh, published um, important books on the graphic designer Barney Bubbles, which I don't know, Paul, has that gone through three yeah, editions? The, uh, the last so far? edition, the third edition came out last year. Yeah, you're quite right. Yeah, no, the hugely important figure um, across music, design, um, and Paul, Paul's book really is the kind of go-to uh, book there. Paul has also published on Mr. Freedom, on Tommy Roberts and British fashion design. Uh, an amazing book on the pop artist Derek Boschia, uh, Rethink, Reentry. Um, a big book on the, his the story of the Face magazine, which is another definitive volume. I think the magazine that changed culture. I think the, science, the subtitle of that one was. Um, more recently, the life and times of Malcolm McLaren. That's got a suitably sort of Victorian title. As <laughs> I thought to, to that volume, the, 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 the artful dodger. And and more most recently, Paul's um, book on the rise and fall of the music press called Totally Wired, from um, originally two thousand and two. The paperback came out this year, I believe, Paul. So that's a really very brief sketch of um, some, some of the highlights of Paul's publishing um, career. But he's also curated a wide range of exhibitions, some sometimes on uh, the, the same topics as the books, but covering the uh, wide range of topics in 20, 20th and 21st century fashion, music, um, right. and all the rest. So poor Paul, I mean, that's... Um, where does where do art schools fit into this for you, or do they? You know, does it does this feel like an art school? Well, it, it's year? only by doing something you find out why you did it. I think quite a lot of the time. And um, uh, we had lunch with uh, the great cultural commentator and guru uh, Peter York last week, and he's always fond of saying, "I ain't been to no art school," which he thinks <laughs> is the title of a punk rock song. I think. Of the nosebleed song, I think he was a member of the nosebleeds very briefly. Uh, I've been to no music school, but I think what he does there is kind of pinpoint the fact that a lot of people in Britain during the post war period up until today live art directed lives in the with such, such a small island, we communicate visual, visual culture very readily. And um, it's something that has always interested me from being a, a very young man. And as I say, I didn't go to art school. Um, in fact, I left home and school when I was 17 for various reasons, um, which I won't go into. Uh, I went straight to work within a year as a writer. But I'd always responded to the visual aspects of music, for example. Um, and I gathered when I was a young teenager uh, the bands that I was keen on, say the faces, Ronnie Wood went to Ealing Art School, I think, the Stones, you know, obviously, all of those bands from the 60s into the 70s that I was quite keen on or knew about, uh, they all had an art school background. Um, but yet one of the key figures, and he's become such a key figure now, is David Bowie. And he didn't, in fact, go to art school. He was the most art school person you could think of outside of Brian Ferry. 
who of course did go to art school very seriously and studied under the directed light that Peter York has talked about ever since. And so when I came to write my first book, The Look, uh, which was about the incidence of music and fashion and the way that visual culture really informs popular music and makes it pop, as it were, um, I got the Arch Art School product, Malcolm McLaren, to write the forward, because it seemed to me that he would have a beat on what was important. And he always talked about his obsession with the look of music and the sound of fashion. And that really summed up the look, as it was called. And I didn't call the look because of that. It was just a coincidence that it was the only way to address this subject that reflected street culture, high culture, low culture, popular culture in, um, in a sort of graspable way. Um, and then as I progressed, I wrote books with Boy George and Goldie and um, other books, but constantly art schools would come into play. When I wrote about Tommy Roberts, you know, he went to uh, yeah. Goldsmiths for a year, did a foundation course in the late 50s, and then constantly employed in his uh, shops, his design shops. He was a design entrepreneur. He constantly employed the latest raft of Royal College graduates, you know, in terms of fashion or um you know, the people coming out of uh, furniture design in the early 80s in his shop, Practical Styling. And then when I wrote the book about Barney Bubbles, the graphic designer, of course, he spent five years at Twickenham Art School in every single discipline and majored in packaging, cardboard packaging for retail display. <laughs> and this out in his beautiful technical exercises that he produced for bands like Hawkwind or Elvis Costello much later on. So it's, it, it struck me within a few years that this was a constant in my interests. And so when I became interested in the photographer David Parkinson, who McLaren introduced me to his work, Parkinson died in 1975, but in the four years after he left Regent Street Poly, where he'd studied photography, um, he produced an extraordinary body of almost street fashion photography, very influenced by Guy Bourdin, but made very English by his execution. And then, of course, he was an art school product and he engaged with art school people. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, it has become a, a motif in my work and I'm constantly thinking about it. One of the projects I was talking to McLaren about, not long before his death in 2010, I think in 2009, I wanted to embark on a history of British art schools and he was going to write the introduction. And of course, he went to eight art schools. This that um, you guys <laughs> produced when Kaz Facey and I organised this event at St Martin's in 2015 to celebrate the first Sex Pistols concert and I talked to you about Malcolm at the time because I was heading towards writing his biography and so you produced this limited edition shirt which had the entrance to St Martin's in Charing Cross Road on the front uh, then on the back in a tour I thought it was a genius move by you uh, a sort of tour t-shirt oh, that's fine, yeah. <laughs> that he spent at British art schools so um but that's a beautiful thing and I love it very much. But um, Malcolm was an art school expert, you might say. And so he was very, uh, you know, I was sort of, because I didn't get that further education, I have a feeling that I gravitate to such people to draw in. People like Caroline Kuhn, who of course went to St. Martin's and founded Release in the 60s, managed The Clash in the 70s, is a figurative artist today. She comes out of this movement. Celia Burtwell, who I interviewed for um, the look, uh, of course, went to Bradford um, at the same time as David Hockney and also her partner, Ozzy Clark. And so, as I say, if you, if you cut into the people and the subjects I study, you'll find art school running through it very seriously. <laughs> 
So you mentioned you mentioned David Parkinson. Now he was he was from Leicester, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, is that and, right? And that's another theme which has arisen through my work. It came to the fore really when I wrote the first edition of the look. Is that there were several groups intersecting concentric circles of influencers, I suppose we call them now, players, people who made the moves. Uh, Aristos in London, Chelsea Aristos in London, working class art school people. And in the Midlands, this group of very hip young people, because they had access to the great manufacturing, and it was kind of in their blood. Work, I was working recently with the shoe brand Denson's, which has been revived. So I was in Northampton quite often. And so I understand that it's something in the air there. You know, I've interviewed Paul Smith extensively. He's written introductions, books, and we've worked together. He took an exhibition and a book launch of mine to Tokyo in 2006. You know, he lives and breathes clothes because he comes from that area, which has lived and breathed breathe clothes for you know centuries so I'm very interested in somebody like Parkinson when he studies photography comes out uh, works for Lord Snowden he's particularly interested in clothes and particularly interested in presenting those clothes in an interesting way so he was sort of a proto stylist he had one of those little hurricane bubble cars and <laughs> scouting locations, odd locations in Hackney for you know, strange footwear, where he'd then bring people in Western styling clothes and pose them against it, or billboards in Brixton. So he was sort of running around town, but constantly thinking about clothes and visual expression. There's a story that he was a great collector of vintage ties, um, and he got one particular one with an atomic design, and then... Brian Ferry wore the same tie on a cover for uh, one of his records. And so David went the next day and sold his ties. Because <laughs> he didn't want them to be had by somebody else. It's kind of an elitist thing, but it's also an obsessive turning over of the impact of visual style, which I quite like. Yeah, no, I, that, that's that's a that's a great story. You have to be you have to be ahead yes. of the pack somehow. I mean, the other thing that comes across when you're talking about the the, the these people is that kind of the, there's there's the artistic side, but there's a really strong entrepreneurial element to this, isn't there as well? Where it's kind of art and industry kind of operating at the same time, um, and the the role of the shop or the boutique mm. uh, in in your in your work really kind of suggests that the, the the shop itself becomes like a gallery or a studio or I mean is you know did, does that sound does that sound yeah, like a reasonable absolutely. connection? It, it becomes a, a full space, uh, an area of exchange of ideas where exchange of ideas is predominant over the actual selling of things or the people running these shops are interested in provoking, intimidating sometimes cheering up, interacting with either passers-by. I'm writing a book about Granny Takes a Trip at the moment, which was the late 60s oh, um, yeah. boutique, which changed its facade, you know, had a pop-up rendition of Jean Harlow at one point, where you could only see inside if you looked through her lips. At another stage, had the front end of a Dodge, 48 Dodge, projecting from, and you see pictures from the time, and there's always some old bag pulling a shopping trolley outside. And so it's a great intervention without even thinking about it. None of those people who created those uh, spaces at that time, um, talking about Greenwich Takes a Trip in particular, went to art schools, but they were interested in provoking and upsetting. We'd use the word disrupting now, wouldn't we? And so <laughs> the shops that I went to as a, a teen, from Sex through to Johnson's in the King's Road and others, robots, and they're always quite challenging, but they're also an area where you talk to people and you exchanged or received information which was outside of your ken. And I find it now has moved to other areas. I don't think we can stop it within ourselves in these aisles. And so a friend of mine, uh, Jermaine Gallagher, who has who is a designer and dealer, he has a space in Borough 
which is attached to a vintners and was previously their storage room and it's his showroom for the furniture that he designs and sells and regularly there are gatherings there there are little exhibitions there's some wine there are young people believe it or not you know from art schools or otherwise interested in fashion or music who just gather and and hang out and so that's that's a really valuable thing and this area that I look into I think that I, I try not to be nostalgic I went to this great Irish exhibition the Irish in Britain a couple of weeks ago and the title is looking back to look forward and I try and do that in my work in that I think that there are spaces for all of this activity in contemporary culture. Of course, they're online, but also, and of course, it's very difficult to grab hold of physical spaces now since property is king. Yeah. But I don't think you can suppress that. I think the will without, by, by whatever means. I was interested that you were telling me about rooms above pubs, which are over as sort of arts labs or art schools. Yeah, well, one of, one of the one of the things that you know the the project is aiming to do is 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 to trace the history that we felt was being lost, really, and the just in, not just in terms of the number of art schools that the UK had, but also you know this kind of claim that almost every town had one. Well, we thought, well, let's go and find them and see what's happened, and you know, quite a lot's happened. But one of the, one of the re-emerging things that we've been very aware of and um it, it's been happening for some time is these people are starting up so-called alternatives and you know literally in rooms above pubs or you know unused unlet shops that kind of thing but what's curious is, is is as we've done more and more research a lot of these art schools never didn't start with a building they just started with people meeting somewhere they just started with people meeting you know in a room in the mechanics institute and then literally over decades and john's done quite a lot of work about this in relation to warsaw art school there would eventually potentially be a building but it was it was people a life's work sometimes to get these buildings built they were they weren't just there and people went to them they were the result of um local people really believing in the importance of you know art schools being being part of their their town That's it's, it, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because we think of art schools as being there for such a long time. It's all almost not containable. But in fact, you know, there was that moment. Everything has its moment and then dies and then flourishes in a different way. And I'm a true believer in, in that that's happening now. And it's really encouraging to hear that people are taking over those spaces. Otherwise, what are we going to do with all these spaces in these high streets? What are they going to do with them? You know, so much space well, in this country. I, yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I think what, what's what's interesting is what we've, you know, we, if you look at if you look at what happened in the nineteenth century, is that the if the fair sort of local entrepreneurs and and were, were, would kind of sort of develop art classes and then raise the money for a building and so there are lots of that you know there are still the remains of lots of victorian art schools in town centers but they're very rarely you know, nottingham is quite unusual in the sense that its 19th century building is still part of the school right. of art um, as part of the university but that's that's increasingly unusual certainly outside major cities and so what, what, what you have instead is, is a sort of a resurgence of that sort of curious entrepreneurial spirit where people are looking to build their own their own communities, their own artistic communities. Because I think, it, I suppose one of the things that interested us was less the sort of institutional history, if you like, but the idea of an art school as a kind of meeting place, as a, as a, as a community space, as a, as a where, where kind of identities are formed and where ideas are kind of emerge. So it, Although we we're kind of using the building as a really not necessarily for architectural reasons, but rather as that's the marker, that's where you that's where you see what kind of world emerges out of that space. Um, right. But what you say, like you say, you know, our, our towns are now kind of full of empty shops, aren't they? Yeah, it's, it, it'd be interesting to imagine what might what might emerge out of that. So. Yeah, exactly. I'm interested in you mentioned identities are formed. Um, 
there's a, a section in the McLaren biography uh, where he told me that his mother was quite overbearing. His grandmother was incredibly overbearing, but um, marched him when he did only two O levels, marched him down to the labor exchange, which is where you went and got jobs in those days in the early 60s and got him a job actually at a vintners. This is a bit of a theme of this um, uh, in um, in the center of London where he was apprenticed as a wine taster. And this didn't take long. I mean, he, his story is full of these Dickensian episodes that you wonder whether they're true, but of course this actually was. Um, and it was quite close to St. Martin's, uh, where he was marched up to lunch with the other boys who were apprentices as well, uh, and passed St. Martin's and saw these boho types hanging out outside at lunchtime. And so ventured in um, and gave up being an apprentice and he was spoiled by his grandmother. And so she paid for him, I think, to get some materials together. And then he studied. He took a class there, life class, and his mother was disgusted by that. But eventually he went to art school. He went to Harrow Art School, which was his local one. Um, and he was a mod, I guess you would call him at the time in, in that way, sort of very French style that had been adopted by the kids who hung out in Soho, such as Mark Feld, who became later Mark Bolan. But um, he says in the book, and he said to me, when I went to art school, I had to start looking like an artist. <laughs> and so he got his grandfather, his tailor grandfather's shears, his grandfather had made him this beautiful coat, woolen coat, and he cut it off. So it was the length of a pea jacket or something. And so the threads hung down. He didn't wash his shirts. He saw the Rolling Stones around that time. And what most impressed him was the fact that they wore grubby white shirts. They wore white shirts, but theirs were really filthy. You know, they had that kind of art school look, I guess. And so he then said, to become an artist, I had to look like an artist, which I thought was really no, that's That's perfect, and, though, isn't it? Yeah. And in a way... I think that, you know, once you walk through that portal, once you decide on some kind of art directed life, you have to make that transition into showing that in some way or other. Don't you think? After, yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a great story because it does sort of capture something of that sort of self invention or reinvention or or, or trying on identities through that. The, the, the space space makes that possible, right. doesn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things we we've written or talked about before is the idea of art school as much as the art school itself. You know, it was a it's almost like a conceptual idea, and well, I think from John and my early experience, the idea was rather more grand <laughs> than perhaps the reality of going to a small provincial art school in Great Yarmouth. But but the idea was very important. I think, and that idea was communicated through things like, funny enough for me, through the music press, because there'd always be these oblique references with the interview with, you know, um, whoever it might be, Jeff Beck or somebody like that. Oh yeah, I went to art school, and that would be it. There'd be nothing else. I mean, there'd be no nothing else. But it was just like that's the ground, that's the sort of ground zero where all this great stuff comes from. And I was kind of always really meant, you know, what what was what was going on there? Yeah, you know. They, that all of this stuff came from and of course later on there was that there were you know I guess in the mid late 70s there were people who would just go to art school to form bands that was the idea that's where bands are created you know they become an incubator for a whole scene quite self-conscious yeah. doesn't it because yeah I'm Nick Jones who I absolutely love I think he's such a lovely bloke but he said he went to Hammersmith Art School because he'd read about Pete Richard I can't remember which Sid, Sidcup. Sidcup. Tuning up in the lavies in Sidcup and then meeting somebody else, maybe Dick Taylor. And so yeah. they got together and started forming the Stones. And there's this great thing, Nick Jones and those people, the second or third wave of rock and roll is going, OK, one of the building blocks to this is to go to art school. And of course, the whole of punk really is can be seen through one lens as being an art school generated movement and all the better for it in my view i know that at the time people sneered about it i thought well, that's really good that's really exciting 
I mean, I'm not, I'm far from an authority, but you do think that most of the key major bands had that art school connection in the way that you were alluding to right at the beginning, you know, whether it was the Beatles or the Stones or the Clash or the Sex Pistols, they've all got that. Um, And wasn't it someone read, I read somewhere recently that Pulp were the last art school band. I I don't know whether that's true or not. Is, I'm, I'm sure that I could come up with examples of current bands who, who have attended, you know, humanities courses or art schools in one way or another. But another thing strikes me, which was very important to McLaren. You know, he told this story about he survived the first year at Harrow um, and the beginning of the second year, he claims it was a grizzly. He used to do a terrible Yorkshire accent, but he claims it was a grizzled northern arts and crafts you know, person who said, well, you think you've done now, uh, but, you know, what you've got to do now is to learn to fail. Um, and I think the great things about art schools, and you'll be able to tell me, and current students will be able to tell me whether it's the case now, is there was space to fail. You know, I started work as a journalist when I was 18, as a trainee journalist. Um, on a trade paper, a very unglamorous trade paper. If I fucked up, I'd be out of the job, you know? And so I had to be on it in terms of either reporting, taking a photograph, laying out, subbing copy, whatever. It seemed to me that at that time, maybe no longer, there was scope to try out different things and fail at them all until you found out what your metier was, or maybe you never did. Uh, is that is that the case, that that failure, which I think is so important to the creative process, has been taken out of the well, I, sp- I mean, I suppose broadly, broad- broadly speaking, you know, the education system has become a lot more managed. And, you know, students entering courses now are probably better qualified than they've ever been. But it's also very much more regulated, I suppose. And that's maybe that's tied up with sort of broader shifts in the economy. I suppose the period that we're talking about in the sort of immediate in the post-war decades, um, when, you, when you're talking about full full employment in, in the economy, then there's all there's all sorts of ways in which you're yeah. allowed to fail because there's somewhere else you might be able to go. So I I think you know the way that things have become much more managed and, and Controlled is partly a kind of an effect of the sort of world we live in now. I mean, one one, one of the ironies of this is that um, one of the things we're sort of working out or mapping is that whilst there were certainly a lot of these small um, standalone art schools in in, in all sorts of places like Accrington, etc., um, and they you know they were to some extent. Um, self you know very self-directed and they were very and i think key very separate from universities they were they were distinct and separate it was an alternative to going to work it was an alternative to going to university um the irony is we've probably got more people studying art now than we've ever had i mean you know i mean in terms of the number of universities with art departments and the number of students that they recruit um so there is you know there is something interesting about when when students even with the debts that they're being uh, they're having to take on they are still choosing to do this really precarious, strange thing, uh, whether it's fashion or art or graphics or whatever it might be. And so th- th- what you were saying about at the very beginning about something in this aisle of that lingering or that sort of way, the visual culture is so powerful, even though you wouldn't necessarily know it from the from the kind of more um, official culture, you know, especially street culture. It does It does seem to carry on no matter what you throw at it however however it's suppressed it pops up i curated an exhibition at somerset house in 2018 called print which was about the independent print in britain from 1918 to 2018 as it was then as you know the year that the exhibition was staged and what was really great was i took as my my start blast the publication of blast actually yeah. 14 the Vault Assist, mm-hmm. so come arts, in, uh, which I recommend to everybody, actually, despite its slightly dodgy political aspects, you can take them with a pinch of salt, but it's a beautiful thing. Um, right up until at that stage, the resurgence of print and young people coming to that, just I was over, you know, whelmed with 
the magazines, the zines that they were publishing, uh, as a result to obviously the clinical nature of the digital world in terms of creation. But also that thing that you're talking about, you know, it won't die. It, well, I think it's a really positive aspect to modern life is that there is this kicking against the pricks, which is the official culture, as you say. And that was pure evidence of it. You know, I was just looking at one area, media, independent media at that, and it was really alive and, and kicking. And I know for a fact that in the worlds of fashion and music, um, and media that that continues, you know. I mean, the, the other thing I thought was, you know, I'm seeing sort of around that history is that it wasn't ever just the art school. I think the boutique and the coffee bar and maybe the folk club were all part of this kind of culture. And uh, if you had an art school, you probably had enough of an audience to go to the folk club who would buy a coffee and may go and buy something at the the trendy, the one trendy interesting slightly left field boutique boutique so there was i suppose one of what i'm interested in is how they built they maybe sustained a small culture a small bohemian culture within the most unlikely of places to us you know the way you might perceive it now and whether there's now because of the property prices in london a return to that is that something you've perceived at all well certainly there's um you know art communities, people who live together, who produce together uh, in the same way. Uh, one of them, a friend of theirs, I was told about one in particular, um, and he meant it. Do they actually squat? No, they don't, because you can't squat. No. They lived in the squat for a year. You cannot do it. Um, but still, it's part of that ethos, which is, this isn't a particularly bunch of rich kids or whatever, but they're together, there's doing their own things there's a glass blower there's a performance artist mm. people doing stuff either together or separately and i think those clusters are still around um though the, the opportunities for a lot of people just aren't there i don't think but it, it's still it's encouraging i was involved i am involved with this magazine tongue I mentioned Jermaine earlier, who's got his space in Land Street in the borough. Uh, this is his magazine, which is an anti-world of interiors magazine. <laughs> so it's about the, the unsung and the looked over and the ignored by the official world of interiors, literally. Um, mm. And um, this is, you know, a lot of these people are art school alums um, and a lot of them live art directed lives. You know, they're challenging you know, the kind of Daily Mail business about gender fluidity or the ways in which they operate aren't necessarily a provocation against official culture, but they're, they're mining their own way through through the world in a really encouraging way to me. It's really, you know, it makes me um, think about I should be covering this stuff rather than the stuff from the past which I've covered fairly extensively now over 20 odd years. Although I suppose that, I mean, that, that, that point about um, sort of um, experimental identities is always, it, it, it's, there's a sort of history of that too, isn't there, in art schools. And I suppose art schools were, uh, in this country, as opposed to universities, were always much more um, even evenly divided in terms of male and female students, you know, the, the, the female university population for many years was very, very small. But art schools always, always had a kind of a more sort of a more, more sort of contemporary field in terms of the kind of gender gender split. And I, I wonder whether that that kind of history of um experimental communities if you like is also or well, there's, there's also something there about um the way that the, the broader culture has sort of picked up on some of those some of those subcultural yeah movements. i mean i mean these are literally full aren't they you know in in terms of estate agents terms they're hoping that these people live there in areas and so that everything rises yeah. with them yeah. i think the one thing we can't ignore is the misogyny, casual racism, sexism of this great art school moment that we talk about from, from the late 50s through to probably around punk. I think everything changed and I'm not being an old fart here. I just think if you look at it, um, 
things that were acceptable in alternative culture no longer became acceptable after punk because it drew the line so rigidly. So, you know, punk produced a lot of female, powerful female performers and musicians who rivaled the men in many ways. And then, of course, we go into the 80s and the fight against Thatcher and, you know, the, the lines were drawn very seriously. It's only in the 90s when things started to creep back and new lad comes in and a new generation. But that period we're talking about from the late 50s to probably the mid 70s, you know, there was there were really, you know, women were, you know, despite this creative artistic outlook, Women were regarded as second class citizens, I think, a lot. And, you know, having covered certain artists' lives, you know, the relationship between lecturers and students wasn't healthy. Um, and in fact, I was working at, um, on a project at a, 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 an art school 10 years ago or so. And that, was, that kind of attitude was still right, whether it was going on or not. I thought that there was some fairly reprehensible stuff going on in terms of attitude, if not actually action. Do, do you agree that I think we ought to look at this with a, in a clear-eyed way? Oh, yeah, I think it would be, I mean, it would be a mistake to um, be overly nostalgic about the good old days, I, I think, yeah. for, lots, for all sorts of reasons. And I don't think, I mean, we, as part of that, we certainly don't want to to be sort of fall into that that trap, but I I, I suppose that it, yeah, I mean there were there, there were still lots of stories to to to, to tell, aren't there? And and, and it, it feels like you know, there's a long way to go. I mean, one one of the things that's been interesting with the, with the various shows we've been doing over the last I don't know five six years is what the audience is um, coming in and talking to us about some who, who went to some of the buildings that we've been photographing and documenting and their memories and recollections of that. And it's not, as you say, it's not all rose tinted and it was all marvellous, but also it was for many people quite a transformative thing to have done, you know, and it was also in many ways quite, um, it was stepping outside the norm. It was like, I'm actually going through that doorway into something which is not quite the norm. And even though uh, and most of these people haven't become, certainly most of the people who speak to me haven't become super famous. They've had interesting lives and they've, they, and they, and they, I think what they've taken from the work is partly recognition of that moment has been acknowledged. And one of the big things I was thinking about a lot with this project was how many of our great universities and you know, stately homes are all preserved and there's organisations to preserve them and they spend millions, and, if not billions, on that. And yet something which was such a pivotal part of our culture and continues potentially with its legacies to be, is being demolished, literally. I mean, we've got loads of pictures. We've got, we've got all these car parks that are arts, where art schools and now they're car parks. I mean, we're going to talk about doing a show of demolished art schools, you know. And it's, and it's, and I, and I, that, that I think speaks to, you know, a particular attitude, a particular view, which is, is what we've been talking about. At the same time as, you know, in, in these aisles, we're a small island and we communicate visual, we're talking about visual ideas, we, we communicate those visual ideas very quickly. I think also this is an anti-intellectual island. I think that, you know, don't get above yourself. You know, if you go to France, Italy, Ireland, the island of Ireland, writers, artists are revered. You know, they're a part of the culture. We were in Dublin a couple of weeks ago. I'm working on a book about the Irish diaspora. And we walk past the block of flats. I mean, you can't get away from these fellas anyway. You sit down in a pub and look up and there they are. There's a block of flats with four towers and each was, you know, named Yates, Joyce. Yeah. You know, that wouldn't happen in England. You wouldn't get Hockney Towers. In I don't know. You might now. <laughs> you probably will get luck. But. This is, you know, it's it's almost a craft which is part of the folk universe of a country in many countries. Here it is that art student is still probably an epi you know, a derisory term, isn't it? And, you know, to be a writer sometimes, and quite deservedly sometimes, you know, you, you consider to be above yourself. I just think we have that thing, which is probably why it's so robust because it's ready to be abused. You know, as soon as they start, mm. the man in the street, 
newspaper is going to have a go at them. The Daily Mail reader is going to say, you look ridiculous or I don't agree with you. So maybe that's part of the push me, push and pull of uh, what makes this whole subject quite fascinating. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose that, you know, one of the things that's sort of come out of what, what you, you've been saying, Paul, is that sort of that. The the the, pe- the 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 kind of people we're talking about, yeah, they are they they are the sort of sort of. There's a sense of being deliberately sort of distinctive and outside, but also very sort of business oriented and able to turn that kind of unusual those unusual ideas or that un those sort of unusual sort of uh, identity into something else, you know. And so there's a there's a kind of weird sort of there's an ambivalence maybe in this country but t- towards that, in that, you know, it, it's 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 easy, it's kind of well easy to market the the British sensibility overseas as the eccentric creative types. And yeah, it doesn't you're right. I mean there's a sense in which sort of the more serious end of um artistic endeavor doesn't get quite the, the same profile as Yeah, uh, I know. And- there is this sort of derision from the current powers that be that aren't going to be in power for very long by any any measure. But, you know, they use culture because it's the only thing we've got, really. It's the only thing we produce they, uh, to uh, a high quality level, which draws people around the world. And they use culture in a way that is quite dismissive at the same time. Um, and it, I think it's quite you know, destructive as well, because I think that it's very difficult for young people to make their way anyway. And to be discouraged is, you know, really terminal for our prospects, I think. There you go. There's there's a good note to end on. (laughs) Let's see what the audience think about that, Paul. Well, okay, we've got some questions, haven't we? Yeah, there's a a, a couple of questions here. Can you see them, Paul? Or do I... I've got they flash up and let me have a I've look. got I've got one about what's the um so far what's our favorite art school building John favorite one um I'm quite I'm quite impressed with Derby actually it's a kind of wow. grand gothic monstrosity that was built in two stages I discovered when I was researching it it's this kind of huge monster it's like a huge kind of tortoise that's that's been sort of thrown out of the ocean uh, onto the onto we've the. Put a picture of it, Alex. Um, yeah, I, I I I might go along with you on Derby. Actually, I mean it is, and I had I, a while ago um, where I worked. George Hardy, the brilliant illustrator, um, used used to teach there at Brighton, and and he was telling me, and I don't know if this is true or not, um, that when he he knew about Derby is at one point it had a small zoo which was actually part of the art school with various animals classes yeah yeah and it, it it's that eccentric it looks it looks like something out of Willy Wonka or something I mean it is a kind of bonkers building but it's um it's it's brilliantly you know it's still standing but it's surplus to I think it's for sale actually I do think it's for sale I think it's one of the ones that's for sale talking about for sale I, I did like St Martin's um it's probably the only one that I knew at all just from visiting it. But I think there's that grand irony in that it was um, converted into mm. oils with luxury flats above it. And the refectory was on the sixth floor, which is where the Sex Pistols had their first gig. And it was converted into a luxury penthouse suite for a certain person who paid £10 million pounds for it. And so there's the story of... <laughs> the British art schools. Well, one of one of the things about riffing, riffing off that was that when that was going on, there was we gathered together some sales brochures from the property company who were selling these luxury flats. And one of the things that was interesting is the all of the brochures were were featured, you know, you are you are walking in the steps, footsteps of Gilbert and George. And they they just used the entire culture the whole history of St Martin's School of Art, that building, and all the famous, you know, Anthony Cairo, Richard Long, etc., all the artists that have been there, as their marketing. And it's interesting, isn't it, that it took a property company to understand the value of that history. <laughs> because it's the only thing that we've got to sell. You know, it's the final thing for sale in Britain. I mean, we, uh, Kaz and I, were 
talking to a magazine at one point about doing a project on those uh, property uh, hoardings, you know, around new luxury flats that are going up. Um, one we took a photograph of in Ealing in West London had, um, you know, the usual pile of expensive coffee table books, including one on the clash on the, you know, for selling these million, million pounds. And so, yeah, they're constantly cherry picking away at that. It's like the Sex Pistols being part of the 2012 Olympics, you know, that's really McLaren's final yes. try. Yeah, I mean, there is a there is a, there is a sense in which it all becomes it all, it all becomes marketing in the end, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. there, there are other art school buildings which are now flats that are called the old art school building, you know. Uh, and and the other thing the other thing I, is that we've noticed in the last few years is that although all lots of art schools have been amalgamated into universities and for a long time were kind of invisible parts of university sort of organisation, they're increasingly rebranding themselves as the school of art even though they are you know still part of the university but the, the those words seem to have come back into fashion and when yeah. we when we first started this project when you were, when I was trying to find information about the art schools most, a lot of universities didn't really have much of their history on the website but now they do yeah. you know in the in the last 10 years a lot of a lot of universities have realized that they have a really rich history that they haven't really been using um and so, curiously, it, you know, that, that history has become, you know, it's become valuable again. Bizarre. Which just goes to prove the uh, truth of the best album title ever, which was Pete Brown's Piblotto, the band was called, and the album title was The Art School Dance Goes On Forever. Yeah, that's right. Our, our friend and our friend Brian Biggs actually displayed that album cover at our first show as a sort of in a, in a little vitrine for everyone to go and admire. And, uh, because the, because because that drawing, which is done by uh, Mal something cartoonist, is actually the basement at Liverpool School of Art where the Beatles and John Lennon would have actually had rehearsals. So it was a really nice, it's a beautiful link that to that history. Yeah, yeah, that's really fun. Are there any uh, there is another question about Malcolm McLaren and classic cars, Paul. Yes. Have you got it? Can you see it? I can't see it, but um, me... if you put on the chat, what does it say? What does it? Oh, say? Let me, do you want me to read it out? Yeah. Um, uh, story from Toxteth Tracy. I studied at Greengate House in the early eighties. My uncle was best friend. At age 14 with Malcolm McLaren, bonding over American classic cars. Tracy had to convince their principal that photography was art. Their tutor was David Page, question mark, the Hornsey art occupation, the film. So it sounds like it's, a, it's less of a question and more of a sort of memory. Um, Love to find out new stuff about him. He, um, he didn't learn to drive until he moved to America in 1986 uh, to become a Hollywood producer and apparently it was absolutely terrifying to get in the car with him particularly in where he just drove yeah. into hotels and things like that but among the things that he left when he died which wasn't very much I mean his estate I think was 160,000 pounds which isn't a huge amount really I mean he didn't own any property didn't own that's a mate that's a mate you'd have thought it would be yeah so he didn't, you know, this proves that he did not really care about money, um, despite the image that he projected himself. But among the other things were some really fine suits, mainly by Tom Brown of New York, and also a left hand drive uh, Mercedes, which, years, which was an 80s Mercedes, which he drove around Paris. In. That's now with a photographer, I believe. But uh, that was he, that was his uh, that was his contribution to car culture. Interesting fact, as I understand it, about the Hornsey Art Occupation film was the film was a reenactment of the occupation that was made literally a few months after the occupation had taken place. That, that's really great, isn't it? That's like uh, Billy Childish and those people uh, reconstructing the cramps playing at that moment. Oh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 there, was a, there was something about that that I think, it was, I think people recognised it was such a culturally important thing that happened. I mean, there's a special Penguin book released about it in 69. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And, 
but the film, I'm pretty sure that, yeah, that was a reenact. They, they, I think they got the people who'd been part of it to reenact it. Right, okay. Well, Which is a very art school thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> it's, you know. It's sure and postmodern at the same time. But McCarran was, I think he visited Hornsey, but he was very impressed by the actions at Hornsey. He was definitely involved in the LSE revolts. And then, of course, staged with Jamie Reid his occupation or their occupation as Red Malcolm at Croydon in that. Oh, yes, that's right. They were both at Croydon, weren't they? Was that where they met, Jamie Reid and Malcolm? That's where they met, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a quite a detailed question from Jack. Which art school did Stephen Rayner go to, if he did? Uh, and was right. it the same as William English? Right. Uh, Steph Rayner uh, didn't go to art school, uh, but he was a prime mover from Leicester, uh, a friend of David Parkinson's and also David and William English, uh, the photographers. Um, in Leicester as kids, knocking around. And then Parkinson came to London to go to Regent Street Poly. And Steph Rayner was dealing in clothes because the whole area was full of dead stock from the factories from the 20s, 30s and 40s and 50s. And so when McLaren opened Let It Rock at 430 Kings Road in 1971, Steph Rayner was there with his van load of 50s, um, you know, memorabilia and, yeah. with which McLaren stopped the shop. Um, and then later on, Steph opened the shop Acme Attractions, which is where Don Letts was the manager, blasting out uh, dub reggae from the basement of the Antiquarius Market. And Steph then opened Boy, which oh. he sold. It was kind of a uh, punk redux shop which um, uh, dealt in original McLaren Westwood designs in the 80s and he made a lot of money out of that and then the last time I saw him sadly he died last year um, he was still at it operating a shop in Spitalfields Market so you know he was a grafter. That's interesting partly because um, Amiga Auctions had a big sale of boy memorabilia a couple of That's there. That, is that what it was because I mean it was that should have been that shouldn't have that should have been in some kind of archive, really. I mean, it was an extraordinary collection. I think it's a great shame because he had them in the basement of his shop in Spitalfields in the noughties. Um, and I remember going into Boy and ordering the t-shirts, and it was a really great idea. They had these uh, perspex uh, hanging things had the designs in them, and you'd say, I want that in small or large. And that's what he had, and also the screens. They weren't the original screens, but they were the screens from which they screened the T-shirts. But yeah, right. he was um, he was a piece of work sometimes. But yeah, he was an integral part of the whole business. And then, of course, managed Chelsea, the group from oh, the right. X split. So he was, you know, and he also opened a shop called PX, which was a big new romantic shop. Yeah. Wow. What's fascinating about so many of the, 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 the people that you talk about, Paul, is that that, that mixture of sort of innovation and, and retro, what we now call retro. And you're talking about the, you know, selling the dead stock from the 20s and 30s and 40s. I mean, there's a real there's a real kind of history of, of, of the emergence of retro or vintage, isn't there? In, which yeah. feels like another side of this. And it's now entered the, the language of both high and street fashion. Yeah. In the, it's now gone. My wife's going to correct me, but last year there was a big thing about Y2K, so millennials, so <laughs> early 40s clothes were, you know, influencing major designers in Paris as much as they were street markets or, you know, a chain, high street chains. This is part of the kind of populated itself culture of not only fashion, but music and everything else, really. And, you know, I guess that it's, it's a valid thing because, you know, We've run out of road in terms of exploration of new ideas in fashion, it seems to me. Uh, and so the constant recycling and refurbishing and repurposing is is the way it goes now. And I think McLaren really started that. In fact, there was a guy before him, Trevor Miles, by looking back to look forward. There you go. Yeah, well, that's what we do. That's what we yep. seem to be doing, isn't it? <laughs> Great. Great. Okay, so have we got any more 
questions are we at the uh i think that's all the questions yeah i think, I think okay that's... well maybe that was a good line to end on then paul <laughs> i think it seems like perfect yeah for the light under that excellent okay well it, it's been really great to uh, take part thank you very much for inviting me it's good to see you guys again and thanks very much alex for doing the do yeah thanks thanks paul thanks again for i know, really appreciate it we'll, we'll have to meet up in person it's been too long for another 10 years <laughs> i can't believe that okay great see ya bye then bye